Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Patrick Donaldson. I am with uh, Dot Film. Uh, you may, not, may have heard of us, you may have not. We just launched in uh, October of last year, and we have a, a few thousand of these things already registered, but effectively, they're domain names for the film industry. So if you have a production company, you can shorten it up. So if, or if you're a film sales company, you know, we have an example like uh, Highland Film Group. They have highlandfilmgroup.com. And they're like, you know what, I type out this email, it's really long. So now they have highland.film, and it just sort of just really makes sense. It's punchy, you know, they have emails going through. And uh, if you have a film title, well, we think uh, this is a perfect conference for us to actually talk about it because we think there's a life cycle in these film titles. So, uh, you know, when you register, when I, you know, we're entrepreneurs, so when I register a business, I get a website. And then, uh, so if you're a production company, you should get a film title on a website and start marketing that, getting some interest. If you're a film sales company, you should be marketing that to sell the film. And then when it comes time to distribute it, you should transfer that website over to the distribution company. And uh, from there, it's, you know, it'll be marketed to the public. So with that, you have all this SEO built up on the website, and it just sort of makes sense. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. One thing that's really cool about us is we're exclusive. So in order to get one, you must be a member of, of you know, the film community. So this isn't so anyone off the street can get one. We've made this so your, cyber, your titles aren't cyber squatted on, and you know, we want to make sure you get the title that you want. And that's, that's pretty much it. You know, we're not really reinventing the wheel of websites or anything like that. We're just trying to make them more efficient, you know, so you can market them. So you don't have movie title, themovie.com or something like that. You want you know, something really specific like bfg.film. That will be massive, right? So it's, that's what we're really talking about here. Uh, thanks for your time. Oh, and there's a uh, promo on all the uh, pamphlets you got for 30% off your registrations. Could you? All right. Thank you very much. Um, yes. Oh, my God. I was sitting in the first row, and I didn't realize how, how many of you there are. That's uh, wonderful. Mm. You're all very welcome. We're going to continue here today until, uh, uh, f let's see now. 5.50 p.m., uh, just so you know. And I'll just give you the outline. I'm going to speak first uh, until 3 p.m., and then we're bringing on the panel, um, which is going to talk uh, in a more hands-on way about some of the things that I've been touching on uh, with, with this top-level stuff. My name is Johanna Kolyanen. I'm a writer and a game designer, uh, but I'm also a TV and radio presenter and, and producer. And all of this uh, helps me in my additional side gig as industry analyst. And I'm here representing the Nostradamus project of the Gothenburg Film Festival. Uh, Göteborg Film Festival is one of the leading, well, the leading film festival of the Nordic countries. This year we had 30,000 visitors uh, who were offered 450 films from 84 countries at 1,031 screenings. So we're big believers in, uh, in film culture uh, in, its, in its most glorious sense. The industry section with its Nordic, Nordic film market is a very important meeting place. And we pr pride ourselves in our very uh, strongly curated seminars. Some of those that might be of interest to you are the TV, TV drama Vision Days and the Nostradamus uh, seminars that I will mention uh, again um, in a little while. And the Nordic Film Lab, in case you're relatively new to the industry, is a meeting place for newly established professional filmmakers. And I just would like Sia Edson, who is head of industry at Nordic Film Market, just to, to stand up and wave a little bit so you can see her face. This is Sia. So if you're interested in this stuff, you should speak to her, catch her directly after. Now, the Nostradamus project, uh, cockily named because we see into the future, was created originally to help the Nordic film market stay on top of some of these changes that were happening in the industry. And this is, of course, a very resource-heavy job when production and distribution and audience behaviors are changing all at the same time. And uh, I had the pleasure to be involved very early on in consulting on this project, and, and we made two decisions that have proved to be key. One is that we're going to share our research. It doesn't make any sense to do this just internally because everybody is asking the same questions. Uh, and the second decision was that we're only going to look three to five years, three to five years into the future. So now how do we do that? 
So obviously we, we read research that are, others are doing and we follow the news, which is actually helpful, although incredibly time consuming. But most importantly, we speak to people in strategic positions in the industry, because if you're at a senior enough executive level and you're doing something that's, that's forward thinking, whatever you're doing at your job today will actually create that future three to five years from now. And because of the timelines of the film industry, of, of, of the, the life cycles of everything we do, so are you. So if you're a filmmaker today, I know many of you are, in fact, already in executive positions, but if you're a director, for instance, and you're pitching a film uh, at the market this year, that's going to come to fruition probably three to five years from now, let's say three years if, if everything goes well. And that means that you're not going to release that film on some kind of technology or format that you haven't even heard of yet. That's just incredibly unlikely to happen. However, you might be creating that thing, that new thing that you're making, for something that you only heard of yesterday. So if we just speak to people who are a little bit on the cutting edge, that's actually when the future is being built. The future makers are anyone trying a new thing, and that can include, I suspect, all of you in this room. This February, we launched our third report, which uh, you have all received a copy of. And all of these reports are also free downloads on our website, which is nostradamusproject.org. Uh, there, there you can also find video from our seminars. Uh, we do two annually, one of which is in English. And this is intended to be slim, easy to read. There are some statistics, but they're easily digested. The point here is that this is an update, so you don't have to do all of that reading. It covers all of those important buzzword trends in the industry or a selection of them every year. Uh, and I'm happy to report that the one that's two years old is still also very valid if you need an update on the topics that we were writing about then. So, for instance, if you want to know what is ad blocking, how is ad blocking potentially affecting the film industry, for instance, then you can just look, look it up here, and then you, that's probably enough information for you unless you're doing something specifically with that, and then you'll at least know to, to read up on it later. But today, I'm going to do some top-level things. I've went, gone back and read all of these reports that we've made and, and thought about the stuff that we've talked about in our seminars, and I'm going to, today to talk about one thing that all of these trends have in common. And then we're going to take that onwards with the panel. So I will posit today that the dramatic and traumatic changes uh, of the film and TV industries are essentially over. By which I mean that this earthquake has already happened. Some of the pieces are still in the air. The dust definitely has not settled. But we all know what happened. It's happened now. So we can stop sort of cowering and, and reacting to this barrage of things that's affecting us externally without our control and, and go from a reactive position to a proactive and strategic position when we're thinking, asking ourselves better questions in this post-apocalyptic scenario. What happened? This thing that has happened, what did it mean? All of these changes, what did they mean? And also, what should I do now as I'm emerging from the rubble? or perhaps standing on top of a building that's still standing, screaming in joy. What should I do now? And to begin to answer that question, I think we should ask another one, yet, yet another one, which is when did our troubles begin? And to answer that question, we're going to ask ourselves yet another question. So on Wednesday in this room at the big data conference, which was uh, outstanding, uh, Ruth Armstrong from Deloitte said this very smart thing. She was talking about, about how you have to ask very intelligent questions and know exactly what you're doing if you're going to use big data and go, go looking for answers either in your own audience data or perhaps in commercially available data. And she said this. Of course, you have to ask, start by asking yourself whether your audience has already answered your question. Did they write a blog about it? Did they buy a ticket five times? It's quite possible, and it's very likely, that our audience has already told us everything that we need to know. Now, if we agree that the core problem for the film industry is that people will not show up to see the films that we are releasing, or that they are not willing to pay what we think they should be paying for the, for the content, then the audience has told us what we really ultimately need to know. They've given us the answer, which is that very much of our product Either the films themselves or the experience of watching films, or a combination of both, is fundamentally not very competitive. So where did our troubles begin? At these kinds of seminars, 
we ask these questions, and then we think about these kinds of answers. And of course, these are some of the... Uh, that's the Pirate Bay logo down uh, at the right-hand side, if you, don't, if you don't know it. And if you don't know it, good on you. So <laughs> these are, are some of the immediate ogres threatening traditional film viewing culture, and therefore also threatening uh, film making as we know it. But these services did not create the underlying urges. Netflix really didn't create binge-watching, even though you might think that if you're reading the newspapers. Binge-watching already happened, for instance, with VHS boxes. When I don't know if you remember VHS boxes. Some of you are maybe too young. But some of us spent money on VHS, VHS box sets, and then we binged watch those. And there was broadcast marathons where TVs would screen a whole season of a, of, a, of a TV show overnight, for instance. And actually, early cinema was also organized in a way, quite often, where you bought a ticket and you went into the movie theater and then you stayed for as long as you wanted. And piracy, of course, is just as old as copyright. And YouTube, while in some ways a mass medium, uh, it is primarily people talking to people without constraints on geography or time. So it's a social uh, medium, and all social media are based on this urge that people want to tell each other things and show off. In the next few slides, I'm going to quote from the 2014 Nostradamus report, and I just want to say that usually we don't talk about this kind of stuff in the reports that I'm, that I'm, going to talk, that I'm talking about now. Uh, we're much more focused on, on current trends. Uh, but we did condense into two paragraphs about 20,000 years of cultural history, and in the interest of not having to do that again, I'm just going to quote myself. Film and broadcast television represent a top-down mode of culture that is rapidly self-correcting back to the original order of things where humans produced cultural artifacts for their own communities. Top-down, of course, means mass media. Two or three centuries ago, with newspapers indeed, uh, mass media were introduced into the societies of their time, which of course were so strongly hierarchical. And the introduction of these new media coincided with and collaborated with fundamentally, both ideologically and on a practical level, with some other big changes that were happening in society and that together shaped the world that we are living in today. The nation state, who was entirely dependent on newspapers, for instance, capitalism, obviously, and one something that's very interesting to all of us, the professionalization of the arts. So there's a historical moment where your job can be to, to make something creative for a living. And before that, that wasn't actually uh, a job. Or certainly there, were, there was craftsmanship, but the idea of the professionalization of the arts emerges uh, in very broadly speaking. We're speaking centuries here, but at the same time, essentially, as, as mass media. And all of these concepts, obviously, have been very successful uh, they have given us good things, like, like health care in certain nations, and, and together they have given us things like, well, the industry in which we work, and also copyright legislation, uh, which is, is completely re relying on the nation state and, and capitalism as a system. Uh, so we love these things, that's fine, but it's good to remember that they are not inevitable. There was a time when no nation states existed, and it's possible, very likely indeed, that there will be a time when nation states don't exist again. And in fact, all of these massive paradigms are currently in flux, and the problems of the film industry relate very in directly, in fact, to these things being challenged. Globalization is a challenge to the nation state that is accelerated by digitalization. Copyright infringement is a challenge to the capitalist organization of arts production. Uh, amateur content and semi-professional distribution systems are a challenge to professional artists. Now, challenge doesn't mean that they're going to, you know, undermine it entirely. Professional artists are probably not going to disappear, but we cannot pretend like all of these changes aren't currently happening. The democratization of mass media in the last decades is fast correcting this historical blip. And the historical blip, then, in this context is, you know, the top-down culture market. So it's a pretty big blip, but still. Media content and other kinds of culture are increasingly produced by many, for many. And at the same time, the distribution of top-down content is, is increasingly globalized. Now, when you see the words democratization of mass media, most of you will be thinking about the internet. But this is not just about the internet. This has been going on since at least the 1980s. 
Electronics became cheaper and absolutely revolutionized the way we produce music uh, and of course also film and also the way we consumed uh, these media. Video changed filmmaking. It created the home entertainment sector, which, uh, you know, we're all... Uh, oi which we're all uh, sad about with the disappearance of the DVDs. But it also gave us things like community television, many different types of access uh, to media production. And actually, I mean, it's hilarious to think about this now, but even desktop publishing and, and laser copiers uh, were communications revolutions uh, when they were introduced. So it may seem like I'm speaking about this idea of some kind of recreation of folk culture as a challenger to popular culture. Uh, but that's nonsensical. Of course, in fact, the amateur culture producers have been there all the time. Even when people were going to the movies or, or listening to the radio, they were also playing folk music and, and playing in, in high school rock bands like the girls uh, here in, in Australia. And they were participating in theater clubs and they were knitting. And, and all of them were engaging in different ways with the product of professional artists. They were making covers of songs and they were like this. My, I love this. It says Vulcanalia. If you can't read it, it's a, it's a fanzine from 1967, uh, which marks uh, one of the early examples of modern, I guess in contemporary, postmodern uh, even, um, uh, television fan culture. So these are Star Trek fanzines that were stenciled and painstakingly distributed by American housewives creating uh, modern fandom and fan fiction and slash fiction and many other things that are very big today. So all of this stuff, of course, was going on all the time, but mass media didn't cover it. So you couldn't read about it in the culture pages until sometimes in the last 20 years. And even then, only as sort of fun, curious, oh, people are doing this stuff, isn't it cute, type of articles. So all of this was culturally invisible until the internet helped all these people connect and, and also find audiences. And social media made this cultural production very visible. And smartphones, of course, made it ubiquitous. It was always there. But we forgot, and I think in particular we as an industry forgot, that in the age of mass media, it's not just artists that have a need to tell stories. I mean, in, in all ages, it's everybody who needs to tell stories. But in the age of mass media, we forgot it. People want to tell stories. They want to engage with stories, which is not the same thing. And they want to share experiences. And now, of course, we're realizing that even cinema was actually like this the whole time. We as an industry thought in the old paradigm, which still dominates our thinking, we genuinely believed that the value proposition of film was that some creative geniuses called filmmakers, milk filmmakers make art, and then there's restricted access to that art, and then we sell access to that art. And we thought that that was, that was part of, of, of what made it big. And then we realize now that we live in an, in an age uh, where every film is available pretty much all the time uh, to everybody, even for free, and cinemas are still doing very well. That maybe the exclusivity wasn't part of the product at all. A big part of it was the experience of going to the movies and talking to the movies, at the movies, with people who you've been to the movies with and then talking to other people who've had that same experience. And if you're wondering what this slightly terrifying picture is, uh, you might not be able to see it from the back, but they all have Mickey Mouse masks on. This is an early meeting of the Mickey Mouse Club in a cinema uh, in um, Los Angeles. So what is the value of film to the audience who watches film? I'm asking this question because it's incredibly important. Even though we don't talk about it a lot, we should care because the audience is who pays for film. Not the investors, not the funders. They finance film, but they don't pay for the film. The, the income comes from the actual viewers in some way. And this actually includes, if you're making movies in Europe and you're getting a lot of, you're relying on public funding, this is even more important because then some of the people who are paying for your movie will not be seeing your movie. They will rate the value of their investment through their taxes into the sort of general societal value about, of, of film. So that's why I have to ask this question. Now, obviously, film, the work film, which is the pink circle there in the middle, this is the only diagram you'll see today, Film has a value of personally moving or transporting the viewer. I can have a com there's a communication between the filmmaker and me as a viewer through the medium of the artwork. And that's fantastic. 
And all of these other processes are social or collective in nature, and they are only partly produced by this industry. So that's that, those kinds of things, a share experience. Uh, film makes, creates cultural moments and cultural icons. Films estab film establishes role models. Uh, film represents and shapes contemporary culture and discusses its norms. Uh, film is a topic or, or focus for conversation between individuals, but also culturally in a broader sense. And it gives fodder for subcultural identities and social contexts. I've mentioned fandom, but it's also things like film markets and uh, volunteering at film festivals and, all, and, and people who, oh, I don't know, make, want to make, movie, make movies at their high school. Uh, and I'm sure there are a billion other of these, but it's a good exercise to sit, sit down and think about, if we want to think about the full value chain, these things are very important parts of it. Uh, we like to say in, in film speeches, and I'm sure it's been said at the Palais in French many times during this festival also, that film is enormously valuable so to society. And that is absolutely true because of all of these things. And that which has value for society can also give value to the individual indirectly. So for much of the 20th century, knowing about film was a social currency. I think in this room, at this festival, being knowledgeable about film history and having seen all the latest titles and, and being excited about the right mo movies uh, and you know, having an, an opinion about which films should win before they've even been screened, these kinds of things have a big social currency here. And during the last hundred years, they did have a big social currency also out in the world, and I don't think that's true anymore. And that is a big worry, I think, for this industry. This is not to say, all of that green stuff around the movie, is not to say that the quality of art is not vitally important, because it's absolutely, you know, the core. It's the emotionally engaging, beating heart of film culture. To learn to love a film, you have to have films to love. It's funny, some people are my age, and they are smiling at these slides. Not others are like, why are those movie, movies up there? So I'm 38 years old. Uh, I think mine is the last generation where being a film fan or a cineast is a social identity. I don't think there's anything that you are, but when I was 16 and people were like, what are your interests? I would say, like, movies. Nobody says that anymore. That doesn't even mean anything anymore. I was also raised by a film fanatic. I was raised on the Marx Brothers in a culture of going to the cinema basically every week. Uh, but even so, my life wasn't changed. It was shaped by that for sure. But what really changed my life was when in, in the 1990s with this wave of filmmakers, and there are probably 20 movies that I could have put on this, on this slide, um, by these filmmakers and by the festival programmers who made at that time what was still a pu in, in a push economy, made those movies available to me so that I could see them and I could fall in love with Tarantino and, and Lion and, and I could see Lola Rent and be like, oh my God, there are women in film doing interesting things, which was a shocking revelation at that time. Um, and all of these films in different ways drove me, gave me an interest in other ways uh, to look at film history and go to see what, what else is out there and so on. In an abundance economy where we live now, the impact of individual works is lower. So even if great films are being made, uh, they don't necessarily have this impact. And also people aren't seeing them at the same time in that organized way as we did back then. And I think many of those social functions, all the green stuff around the film, can actually be filled by other media as well. I think if you're 16 or 26 years old today and you like exactly this kind of thing, what is it that you will see? And what is it that's going to blow your mind? And what are you going to talk about? And I think it's all kinds of things. And it might be movies. But I think it's going to be primarily TV drama and probably also computer games. That's a little gendered, but still, I mean, basically, that's it, depending a little bit on your age. Uh, blowing minds and shaping conversations. I mean, I, we all watch quality TV drama. Everybody in this room does that, and it's fantastic. Uh, I love it. And if you don't know the image in the middle, Fallout is a very successful and artistically ambitious series of games. Um, some student was laughing in the back row. That's good, of, good on you, but, uh, you know, it's not obvious to everybody. If our cultural conversation pieces are consumed in our living, living rooms, certainly if they're uh, mainstream hit movies, 
it, that will not drive us to explore film history, and that will not drive us to go to a film festival, and it's not going to drive us to engage with film culture in some kind of broader sense. And there's also the fact that the formats are so much longer. If you watch a quality TV drama, it's going to be 10 to 20 hours. If you play a game like this, it's probably going to be 40, 60 hours of your time. And that's great because that drives engagement. You're going to be more, you're actively involved, but you're, and also a lot of your social time over time is invested. A lot of slots in your calendar are going to go to talk about the latest episode of Breaking Bad or, or whatever it is. And this means you will consume fewer works in total. So let's recap so far. What has happened in the industry in the last 5 to 15 years is part of a wider historical shift from a more hierarchical society organized around nation states to a more networked society where digitalization and globalization, uh, globalization enable the kinds of cultural behaviors that people have been wanting to do all the time anyway. And this has led to overabundance of content, a naturally fragmenting market, and the devaluation of the currencies of the old system. This means stuff that was valuable before isn't valuable now. So, for instance, it used to have social value to have seen the latest films even when you knew that they kind of sucked. But that has no social value anymore, so people aren't going to go see a lot of the mediocre content. And this is an enormous problem for us. But creatively, it's a great potential because we shouldn't be making mediocre crap. We should just be making the best and newest and most interesting stuff that people want to see for its own sake. I'm now going to touch briefly on two other currencies of the own uh, system. One is celebrity, and the other is the finished work as an idea. Uh, Variety has introduced what I hope becomes an annual poll. They've done it two, two times a year now, and it's a little bit uh, complicated, so, so bear with me as I explain what they actually do. It's, it's very, very interesting. First, they take a pre-existing list of American celebrities, uh, or celebrities in the American market. And they, these, that, are, that is organized on their Q score. And the Q score is a marketing metric that measures popularity and approachability and hotness, I think, and likability. A bunch of, of like, condensed, you can just say, how popular they are. Uh, and this is for the 13 to 18 demographic. Then they take the top 10 YouTubers, that would be performers, whose main channel are, is YouTube. And then they take those 20 people and they, send that, or they, and they engage with 1,500, so statistically you know, relevant, teens, and they ask them again about the popularity of those 20 people. So the top 10 popular in the demographic celebrities, traditional celebrities, and the top 10 YouTubers. And then they generate this list. So the image is from 2014, and I'll just tell you what it, what it is. The red dots are YouTubers, so the top five slots go to Smosh, the Fine Brothers, uh, PewDiePie, KSI and Ryan Higgs. And if you've never heard of any of these people, it's totally fine, but you should go and Google them tomorrow. You can find a link to this uh, article online. That's the easiest way if you don't know them at all. Or just Google top YouTubers and then, you know, spend some hours that you'll never get back from your life. But it's important to do so. No, I mean, <laughs> I love them, but, but. Then, first film industry uh, celebrity here is Paul Walker in spot number six. So remember, this, is, uh, this uh, was done in early summer in 2014. Uh, he had recently passed away, and there was a very uh, fresh Fast and the Furious film out. So that probably inflates his rating a little bit, but it, he would probably still be, I think, in the top ten. Then Jennifer Lawrence. Now, what did Jennifer Lawrence do in 2013, 2014? She was walking around on different red carpets being absolutely adorable. And what, in what nature was she adorable? She was looking at all of these celebrities and all of the Hollywood system and everything that we hold dear, making this face. I can't believe you guys are doing this. You know, she was like, she was just being like a real person in that very constructed environment, making everybody else look pretty bad, I think, if you, if you think she's wonderful, uh, as I do as well. Uh, then we have Katy Perry there in spot number nine. And then, interestingly, Steve Carell, Seth Rogen, uh, and Betty White. <laughs> so... What we're learning here is, I think, that flawlessness and unattainability these days is not ranked very high by the teenage consumers. They're interested in people who are in some kind of rebellious position relative to the entertainment um, industry that is, that is feeding their careers. But it, so, of course, it can be opposed. It doesn't have to be real. But it feels like they're rebels in some way. Uh, outsiders do well. So again, like industry outsiders, it can be fictional, but that's how it feels. And old people do great. They did the same survey again uh, in 2015, and the results are even more abysmal for the film industry. There's uh, no film people at all 
in the top 10, highest ranking film celebrity Morgan Freeman in spot number 12. I think we're casting movies for young people wrong. They, they like old people as well as young people, it turns out. And quote, quoting the, the Variety article from last year, teens' attachment to YouTube stars is as much as seven times greater than their attachment towards a traditional celebrity. YouTube stars are perceived as 17 times more engaging and 11 times more extraordinary than mainstream stars. And this is so worrying because the whole point of movie stars is that they're, org uh, is that they're extraordinary that they represent something unattainable and fantastic. The entertainment industry used to control celebrity. What the hell is going on here? I'm sorry, I shouldn't be cursing. But this is important because this isn't just about who gets to be on magazines or who gets the most tweets. This is about a power that can be leveraged into, for instance, film distribution deals. This is about the, the financial value of your package. And I'm not saying that, that you should put KSI in a movie. That's not the point, or, or the Fine Brothers. Uh, the point is that there's something about how we're constructing these, these units of viewer interests and, and investing you, view, viewer interest in these humans that we're clearly doing wrong to the younger audiences. You know, and the people who answered that, that uh, poll two years ago are 20 now, some of them. Uh, then I should ask you about games. How many people here identify in some way as gamers? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's fantastic. Yesterday, eight even. In a VR seminar yesterday, there were four people, gamers, in the room. That was a VR seminar. This is very problematic, I think. How many people here play digital games at all? Uh, Facebook counts. Facebook games count, for instance. Okay, that's a little bit more. Okay, this is relatively representative, and I think the fact that you're in this pavilion uh, all, also skews uh, the result, I, because it's representative of the real population, not of the film industry, I'm sorry to say. So gaming today, of course, digital gaming is universal. Everybody my age and younger pretty much plays, unless, unless, unless you are in a position of power in a traditional media industry. If you're an, an exec, if you're a theater director or, some, or a, if you're working in film, then you may not be playing digital games. And this is an enormous problem for us as an industry because it makes us collectively blind to the other most important cultural form of our age. The, the global value of the digital games market is going to be very soon 100 billion US dollars, which, by the way, is the global value of, of, the, of the film market. They're the same size. And this is important because there are two things here that we should not overlook. One, there are now two generations of computer gamers out there. Let's call them your audience, the general population, because it's literally everybody except us, who are very comfortable with lean-in, active, participatory arts where the participant completes the work through their effort and through their presence and their engagement. And even Candy Crush is better than like mediocre movies, I think. Also, this digital games have solved digital distribution. They don't have cinemas. They used to have arcades for about five minutes, and we might get VR arcades again for about five minutes. But basically, they don't have cinemas. They hardly have celebrities. There are so many gamers there who cannot name even one game creator. I mean, some, you know, if you're a super fan and you're very interested in game design, sure. But they hardly even have celebrities. They have big IPs. But they have managed to have a market that is just as big as ours and distribute almost everything digitally, and it works fine. How do they do that? Well, let's, you know, we could talk about it for a long time, but in short, they have a very engaging product that people actually want to engage with, and they have a relationship to their audience in, to which they are actively investing. And that doesn't mean that it's direct sales. That's not the point. There are a lot of distributors and middlemen, but they engage with their audience nonetheless. So uh, I'm going to recap, like, two points of what I've done so far, and then I'm, I'm moving on onwards towards, like, analysis parts. So let's recap two points. One. The democratization of cultural production and distribution has been terrible, terrible for old media institutions like the film industry. And I know I hate using the word old about us, but there it is. As an institution, as, as a system, we're an old system. But it's great, it's, it's great for humans and for powerful new media companies, for sure. My problem is that the conversation that we as an industry are having, still, still, after all this time, and I don't mean we should have started it in the 80s, I actually do mean that we should have started it in the 80s, but at least we should have started it by the time YouTube rolled around. We're still having this conversation up here. Boo-hoo, people are changing things in the marketplace, and it's hurting my business. Well, well boo-hoo. 
You know, we have to stop having that conversation. It's not helping. You can do that while you're cowering, but we have to stop cowering. The earthquake has happened, and now we're moving on, right? So we should be looking at the, at the second part. That, uh, you know what, actually, uh, audience attention, in fact, is shrinking in the windows that require effort for movies. But the event industry is exploding, and cinema is doing fine, and games which require all kinds of effort are doing very well. So the problem isn't really that the audience is lazy. The audience is not lazy. They're just not that into us. <laughs> that's a real, that's the core of this problem. And that's why I'm talking about humans and, and collectives and like folk art and needs. I'm not a communist. I'm a partner in two production companies. I'm very much interested in making content in a financially viable way. But I think to do that, we have to think about all of this stuff on a very high level. So Swedes, where I have the, Sweden is where I have the latest information. Swedes today will watch around 85 movies a year. We're, it is great. 85 movies a year. That's a lot of movies. You can do the math in your mind to how that maps out onto your daily life. Maybe you all, I mean, no, you're all in the film industry, so you don't count. Find somebody who's not in the film industry and try to figure out how many movies they see every week. They see a lot of movies. This content does have an audience, but there's something there with not being willing to pay for it. Either we watch movies that we're not very into, maybe, or we watch old movies that we know we're into, or there's something, again, about the context that is wrong. One and a half of those 85 movies, uh, approximately, are in the cinema. If you live in a city, it's about four. If you live in the countryside, it's about zero. Yeah. So let's look again at the second part of this thing. New media companies are doing really well because they are seeing the humans. They are giving, they're empowering people to, to engage with these behaviors that, that they want. But these two things, I think the, the humans and the new media companies, long term, I think they are in conflict with each other. How do we want to, how do we want, we, I mean, let's say just in this room, how do we want the film industry to operate in the new world? Who gets to control distribution? I get it. When you're in the middle of an earthquake, the path of least resistance is to yield to the biggest platforms. But if Google and Netflix and Amazon and Facebook and Sony, and I should now, after the latest Hulu announcement, I should also add Disney and Fox or, or Hulu to this list. If those hand, that handful of companies is going to dominate film and television entirely between them, it will hurt the production landscape terribly. We know what it is. It's the studio system. Except that this time, the studio, it will be a full value chain studio system where the actual cinemas are in people's pockets. And I, I don't want to produce that market because I'm not big enough to produce in that market. See my problem? So we're going to have to make some choices right now. All of us, everybody who is in film right now is going to have to make some choices about what landscape we want to be in. And I mean, if Netflix comes and wants to buy your thing exclusively, sell it for the love of God, and, but just make sure to get a lot of money because you're not getting it anywhere, anywhere else afterwards. So second point. Film, TV, and interactive increasingly overlap. And I think a lot of people here now who, are, who used to be film pro producers are today also in, in film and TV production, or they make games and VR, or they make you know, TV and VR, and so on. And the old formats, you know, get some new friends, and there are some different behaviors around all of these formats, but they're all on the same screens. So now, your social impact documentary is a direct competitor to Candy Crush in a way that was never historically true, and that's why we have to think about this stuff. It's all on the same screens. We can even watch esports in cinemas today in some countries. Esports is sort of computer gaming for, in a sports-like fashion. Um, but they all have one thing in common, all of these media. They're all pool markets now. So there's an abundance of content, and the person who's actually making the choices is making you know, all the decisions. Why should I see your thing, and why should I see it now? And why should I see it now is the big question. How do you make something unmissable? It, we used to be able to just make it unmissable by making sure that it got attention in specific media, and then that isn't true anymore. It is true, if you have $250 million to spend on advertising your $250 million movie, for sure you can get people, you, you will make a profit on Batman v Superman. I'm sorry if anybody connected to that project was here, but we all understand that it's a terrible, terrible film. And you can also make an irresistibly engaging TV show. 
You're maybe thinking, yeah, yeah, but like people are talking about Game of Thrones every week. Well, the way they did that, the way both Netflix and, and, and especially HBO, who've been doing this for decades, they're working strategically over time. So they start with a very sort of discreet release of a show, and then they build it up, and when it has a fandom, then they start advertising, like season three. So now we're in, what, season six of Game of Thrones? So now it's a global issue, what's happening every week. But that kind of slow build-up is great for television. It's very difficult to do with your you know, one-shot movie. So I did a thing where I took some of these like, you know, trendy terms of stuff that we know works in different ways, big things and little things that we've, for instance, written about in the reports that you can read about there. And I, I looked at what they have in common. And, and basically, this is all. All of these things are about answering just one question. And the question is, how do we make the audience more engaged with our content. And I'm happy to report that there are only five answers to that question, and I'm not going to tell you the five answers, and then I'm going to show you a list of the five answers so that you can take a picture of that slide, and then we've solved a lot of problems. Okay. Uh, so the first answer is, uh, or the first answer is this. If you want to get somebody to make an investment of time or, or money in your thing, that requires them being aware of your product, and it requires trust. You're making some claims. This is worth your time, and this is a great movie, and so on. And they need to trust that recommendation. And this is, of course, why well-known filmmakers, bad, the bad movies of well-known filmmakers are easier to sell and will probably be more profitable than the great movies of unknown filmmakers. So we know this culturally in the industry to be true. But the one thing that you can do, the first thing that you can do is that you can ride on an existing relationship. That's, of course, what packaging is all about. You want to add some, some, some relationship between the viewer and existing talent there. But you can also do it in other ways. So, I, you know, access to talent or social brand partnerships, influencers. You can, you can use social media influencers or celebrities, or you can work, use an existing trusted relationship to a brand uh, to, to get um, the consumers to make that investment. And of course, the greatest trust they have for their friends, uh, it, this used to be called word of mouth. Now we call it social recommendations, which is exactly the same, time, same thing as word of mouth. Um, but it sounds more professional. Uh, so that's the first thing. The second thing you can do is that you can create a special or specific moment so we used to work with the model of artificial scarcity. This film plays now, or you can only see this film here, or something like that. But now, uh, or you know, you remember Disney used to release their classics only for a period of time on home video, for instance. You have to buy it now, because then it's not going to exist anymore. Of course it exists, but they just pretend they're just not going to sell it to us. But you can create an actual scarcity to have the same effect. Something is happening at this time, which will not happen at any other time. Actually, film screenings themselves are now emotionally to the consumer's live events because you have to go to a place at a specific time and then you have to be there and then you'd probably even turn your phone off. So basically it's like going to a gig. And that's great. I think that's one of the reasons why cinemas are doing so well. But of course you can do even more of that. You can create that one screening that means something else. Or um, when transmedia or, or alternate reality games work in advertising, the, the reason it works uh, or one of the reasons that it works is that it has it adds a storyline that's happening somehow in real time. There are specific things that you can only do at specific times that are uh, valuable to the consumer. So you can create a moment. Three, you can build a community around your product. So now I'm talking again about the diagram. You remember the film is in the middle, but most of the value to the consumer of the film is around in the green space. All of that long list of things. Now, people are going to do that anyway, uh, in a way, so you, want, you can make that an interesting place to be. And actually, I think the next two are, not, are the same, same ones. You can tour your films. You can, you can uh, get in there with, with enabling the conversations. Crowdfunding is a pretty crap way of funding you know, anything, but it's a great way of generating ambassadors for your, your project. And there are all of these things you know, that you know what they are. Uh, all of the green things on this slide are about building a, a community. And building a community, by the way, especially if you want to do with fandom involvement, that's not throwing like a really shit PR event where you give branded crap to people. They don't want your letter opener. You know, they don't get letters anymore. Like, they don't want your ugly things. They want an experience. So give them a little experience. It's a, it has a lot more impact than a ton of, of cheap crap. And this is related, of course, for uh, enabling a deeper engagement with the work or around the work. 
So with the work, engagement with the, with the pink dot in the middle could be things like VR. Obviously, people are very excited about engaging directly with the work. But here we're talking about storytelling, craftsmanship, and the powerful voice. And this is, of course, very good news to all the filmmakers. Yes, it still works to make engaging movies. But what about everything around, around it? So I think very often we have a film that's like, it's good. Like, it's not the best movie ever made, but it has like a really interesting theme. And there are some things that are resonant with stuff that's happening. And you're looking at it, and 10 years ago, you would, you would have been like, well, I can make something of this. Like, this is going to make an impact. People are going to talk about this. People are going to respond to this. And then it's going to have a long life on home video. And, and there are going to be, people are going to be writing about it in the newspapers. And these days, I think a lot of those films don't even get released. And if they're not great, I mean, you know, that's fine. But if they, sometimes films that are quite good don't get released because, because we realize that those conversations don't automatically happen anymore, and you have to design for them. So you can release your film, and then you expect people to talk about the theme, but then Donald Trump says something, and then you're screwed, basically. So you have to actively put money into that conversation. And I think that's probably a better investment than putting money in just, like, randomly scattering, you know, a city with advertising, because if you can get some people actually talking about it, the, the impact of that down the line, because of social recommendations, is a lot higher. So you have to invest into activities and frameworks to create a conversation, rather than just telling people that your thing exists. And the fifth and final thing is that you should speak to the needs and interests of your audience. This is so obvious that I'm embarrassed to even say it out loud. It's completely fundamental. And it is astonishing that we, as a community of artists, are only now realizing this. You should speak to the needs and interests of your audience. So if you're talking about personalization and curation and content discovery and audience outreach or pull screenings, all of this stuff is us talking about, like, hey, like maybe we should help the audience get the stuff they actually want. Oh, my God. Yes, and you know, this stuff works. Because as you realize when I'm saying it this simply, it makes a lot of sense. Diversity is on this slide. Diversity is so important for this thing, for relevance. What are the needs and interests of the audience? Well, one of the fundamental things is it's great to feel that I can exist in the universe or that this has anything to do with my experiences. Not for all films. I'm not, a, you know, an alien, and I love so many sci-fi movies. But even there, even there, you know, we have a problem with diversity, which is very weird. Uh, big data is also on this slide. And with big data, what we as an industry will use big data for is to answer only two questions. Um, and now you're going to say, ah, behaviors. But kind of yes, but no. So behaviors are an expression of the needs and interests of the audience. So we're going to use as an industry big data to answer two questions. The first of them is, what are the needs and interests of our existing audience? And the second question is, what are the needs and interests of the people who are not currently our audience? And that's the more important question. Because if we're going to get a smaller percentage of the available time of each consumer, and that's, I think, inevitable, that's the way it's going to be, then we need to reach a larger number of consumers. This is pretty basic maths. What are their needs and interests? So these are the five ways you uh, solve the whole engagement problem. You can pig piggyback on an existing relationship. You can create a moment. You can build a community. You can enable engagement, and you can speak to the needs and interests of your audience. It's very simple when you, when you put it to this, so I'm, I'm uh, looking forward to the panel where they're going to tell us how to actually do this stuff. Um, the first three are answers to the question of how to create demand for something that you have made. And the last two are about how to make something that there is already a demand for. And those last two things have to come first. I know it's really obvious, but we don't actually do that in this industry. We are still in the artist paradigm, so we keep getting it ass backwards. Another way of, of getting, putting this is that the things that we're, we need to make, build with our audience, is engagement, so community, rela relationships, which is, requires trust, collaboration, which requires even more trust, and then, you know, all the on-demand side of things, of, of digitalization, is about flexibility, which is about respecting that people have other things in their lives than, going, than just your piece of art. All of this is about respect. Young people are not stupid, and they don't have bad taste. And actually, that also goes for people who you think are un too uneducated to see your movie or whatever it is. They're not idiots. 
They watch very complicated TV dramas. They play incredibly complicated computer games. They navigate very complicated media landscapes. And many of the people who are not watching our films have educations and powerful jobs just like us. But what they know is that they are paying for what we make. And they don't want to be spoken down to. They don't allow that in any other sector of society anymore. Why would they take that from the entertainment industry? We still have this idea that people should be grateful to see our film. No, we should be grateful that they want to see our film. Say, I've said it before, marketing is increasingly irrelevant and social recommendations is vital. So don't insult your viewers or ex erase viewers or experiences. And this can be everywhere in the value chain. This is a problem. So if you're a cable provider who has a film service and it has a really bad interface and it keeps you know, going down all the time, and then your customers call you and you have shit customer service, that makes people not want to, to see films. They're going to do something else. And if you're a filmmaker and your films are actively insulting to members of your audience or, or they don't even exist in your mind, they're not going to watch your films. That's just the way it is. And I think if you and your team are all white dudes, you may not be noticing how marginal you are. I'm not saying white dudes are bad. I'm just saying that there are also other kinds of voices and viewpoints out there. And I think there's a, a feeling in the industry still, which is very strange, that the people, the audience, get very insecure if, if there aren't enough white dudes there or if somebody else gets to be in the movie. And I think Star Wars and Hunger Games and the Fast and the Furious franchise have proved beyond a doubt that the broad audience handles diversity just fine. You know, pe this is not an issue. The, that this earthquake happened, you know, decades ago. We're fine. If you are making movies exclusively for old white people, and we know there are genres that are consumed mostly by old white people, then you may have to think about what they're going to say if you add the d diversity in your film. But for most of us, that's not a problem. And maybe you would make more money if you made movies for more people than old white people. I have two slides left, and then we're going to let the panel come in. OK. So this is a really simplified picture of the old paradigm value chain in, in film production. What story do I want to tell right now? Asks the filmmaker. And then do I know some people who might be willing to make that film with me? Sometimes that happens in the second step. What version of that film can I get funded? And then you make the film that you can get funded, which is or is not close to your original vision, typically not. And then someone sells my film to some people who should see it, and I don't need to think about it ever again. And I also, in a very literal way these days, I, I'm not going to think about it any, any, ever again. Because even if I'm the producer of that film, I don't have any ownership in that movie. I'm not going to see any of the money, even if it's a hit. So I'm completely disconnected, completely and utterly disconnected from the audience in this process. I mentioned before that com com consumers have a very low tolerance now for inflated institutional egos. And I'm just going to mention some examples. Think about what's happening in private banking with the Panama Papers. Think about, think about FIFA, the Football Association. Think about the car industry. Like, you don't get to lie to or insult your customers anymore. Like, we don't, people won't take it. Why would they take it from us? So we have to think a little bit about how do we treat our audience? Who is paying you know, our salaries with respect? And I think the answer to that uh, is connected to the new paradigm value chain. So when I interview people in sales distribution or marketing, they all say the same thing. Sales distribution and marketing has to work better, smarter, and earlier. Ideally, they all have to come in on the script level. Individual release strategies will be necessary for almost every work, and they are entirely dependent on knowing the audience. And the only way you can know your audience, basically, is to work in this order. So this is still a timeline from left to right, but you have three questions that you keep answering in an iterative way as you work. What stories are interesting, fun, relevant, undertold right now? Then you ask yourself, what story do I want to tell right now? And then, very important question, is it a film? Because the story you might be needing to tell is maybe not a film, and you want to be a filmmaker, so you want to make movies. That's a terrible idea. You make the film when you have the thing that needs to be a film. Okay. And who is the audience who will pay for my film? And when you know the answer to the green question down there, then you know how it's going to be funded and distributed. And then, in the end, digital files will be sold to, through different channels, and some of those channels will be cinemas, uh, which will you know, screen those digital files. And this is fantastic. Just think of what it does. Just think of the liberating potential to you as a filmmaker, you as a distributor, when you start 
well, when you're forced to approach film filmmaking in this way. There are so many things that you can do now, or that you should do now. I don't know if you can do them. Lena will tell us, maybe, uh, in, in this new world uh, post-earthquake. I'm going to stop here. Uh, I'm just going to say some thanks at this point. Uh, thank you so much to Dot Film for supporting uh, this session. Thanks, a special, wonderful thanks to the Marche, who have been so incredibly supportive of the Nostradamus project. Uh, both Jérôme Payard and Julie Bergeron have volunteered their time as experts for us. And of course, without Clara Masso, nothing would ever happen at Next. So I want to say a big thank you to them and welcome the panel up to join us on stage. Thank you. By, by introducing very briefly the panelists and then they'll get to introduce themselves and then we'll talk on the topic uh, of how do we actually do all of this stuff, how do we work uh, in the new world. And as I said, this is a world where we're all already working and we've selected the panelists on the basis that they are in senior positions but not thinking in old-fashioned ways, right? So we think that you all, all have important things to contribute here. Lene Berglum is a producer and co-founder of Space Rocket Nation together with Nicolas winding uh, She had an enormous career at Centropa, where she was, I think, a, a made the, one of the major figures of, of that company. And she has produced uh, internationally successful films for Lucas Modison, Lars von Trier, and Nicolas winding among others. Please welcome Lene Berglund. Anna Godas is CEO and founder of, of Dogwoof. Uh, she has a filmmaking background originally um, and has a Dogwoof work directly with international sales and production investments, among other things. So a very broad competence there. Welcome, Anna. Uh, Martin Dawson is deputy head of unit media support programs in the European Commission. The title continues, but maybe that's okay. Yeah, uh, so he coordinates the Creative Europe Media Program and contributes to the development of audiovisual policy. Welcome, Martin. <laughs> and finally, Mike Goodrich is CEO of Protagonist Pictures, which is an international sales company. And previously, he was the editor and editor of Screen uh, International for a really long time. Welcome, Mike. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I'm going to start by asking uh, each of you. Uh, what do you do, and uh, how has that job changed in the last two to three years? And I realize now I don't actually have a watch, so could I borrow your phone, perhaps? Yeah. Thank you. I know it's very important not to go over time. So, Lena, would you start? Uh, what do you actually do, and how has that changed in the last few years? In the last two years? A few years. Few years. Okay. Hello. Um, I produce uh, director-driven feature films, which is my main uh, thing. And that's what we did also from the early days in Centropa. We built up the whole company around Lars von Trier, director-driven films. And then we built up a lot of other filmmakers uh, along with him uh, and, and made the company really big. Uh, and the way we did it was we just... Uh, used every force we had to to get somebody to do something new which was not seen before and that's how the dogma movement and, and everything um, was invented. So when we got really big, uh, I started missing the good old days when we were a small company and then I started over again uh, in a very small company together with Nicholas Winding Refn and we're actually only the two of us. Right now, um, we have started collaborating, collaborating with our line producer in order to speed up uh, the process and do a little more films because it had taken us three years to do each of these <laughs> feature films. And then uh, on the side, I still find it extremely important to build up also new filmmakers. And the situation right now is it's much more difficult to build up those new filmmakers because... Um, just stop me when I don't have any more time, because uh, right now it is uh, really easy to find financing for films like Nicholas's, which are on a relatively high budget, but still outstanding and still uh, artistic director driven and still not doing the same as any model you might find, uh, always trying something new, crossing the borders, everything. 
but then uh, to, to build up anybody else who has not uh, that kind of, of status as he has achieved right now is getting, I think, increasingly, uh, increasingly more difficult, mm. even though that's what we have to build the future on. So that's one enormous problem that we're going to have to have to return to during the conversation. Okay. Uh, what about Anna? What do you do and how has it changed? Um, I'm the CEO of Dogwood and it's changed, say, in the last five years, we went from being a UK theatrical distributor of... Uh, actually, in the past seven years, we went from being a UK theatrical distributor of anything, really, including fiction, some dogs, to specializing in dogs, because we recognized it was important to, <clears throat> to find the niche and go aggressively. We set up an international sales arm, and we recently set up a production company. So my role has evolved um, from managing a theatrical distribution company to managing an international sales arm and um, production arm now. Do you think, I mean, how much of that change in the company is in response to changes in the, in the marketplace? All of it. We just move with the market. Market dictates what we do. Very good. Martin, what do you do? And how has it changed? Yes, yeah, so at the media program, we support the European audiovisual industry, whether it's film, TV, video games, whatever comes next. And um, we support the development, and in particular, the distribution of these works to make them travel around Europe. That's our mission. Um, it's 25 years old, and we try always to be cutting edge, to be supporting innovation and so we're always changing in fact what we're we always are trying at the change. moment is uh, i mean some the of the digital things, uh, shift of course which is not new but uh, keeping it to translate keep translating it into our operations such as how do on, how does online distribution affect traditional forms of distribution exhibition in theaters and how can we support that most effectively and access to finance again it's not uh, a new problem. You talked about it at length, but we're trying to come up with new solutions to an old problem. And uh, at the end of this year, we'll be, we will be launching a guarantee facility which will help motivate commercial banks to lend on to uh, producers, distributors, and other professionals in the audiovisual industry. So across the whole value chain, we're trying to support the industry and finding new ways of tackling the urgent problems. I, we all agree that what you do is terribly important, but I'm, I am a little curious. Uh, you said you, want, you keep changing all the time, but you're part of an enormous bureaucracy and the changes are very fast. Do, do you feel, how well do you feel you guys are keeping up? Well, it does feel like we're always catching up, but let's say we're always trying to innovate. It doesn't mean it happens uh, instantly. Uh, as you say, we're, I'm not sure we're enormous, but I, I would accept that we are complex as, a, as an organization. And um, we have to always strike the right balance between continuity and innovation. We feel we're close to the industry, and that we are uh, not the industry itself, but we are close to the industry. But at the same time, we need to shake things up and uh, move forward when we uh, try and help people move forward. So it's an interesting balance to try and strike. Yeah. Mike Goodrich, what do you do and how has it changed? Um, I run a sales company, a sales and financing company called Protagonist, which is based in England, in London. And we um, were started in 2008 as a traditional transparent sales organization. But of course, that whole business has changed spectacularly of late um, to the point where I don't know what, how many sales companies there'll be in five years' time. Um, but it's been an exciting time to, to try and adapt to the new marketplace. Um, we've done a lot of business with the digital platforms. Um, we've embraced new ways of, of premiering. Um, and, uh, you know, I think you have to. I'm, uh, I'm sure you guys will be around five years from now. But I I, so. since we're in the interest of, of looking into the future, we always like to ask these five-year <clears> questions. Which companies will be out of business? No, you don't have to name names, but, but what's gonna, <laughs> what, what specifically is going to happen instead, or what is it that's going to drive them out of business? Well, I think um, the traditional sales and finance model is, is for, for, for starters, just becoming 
a lumbering old dinosaur and you can't you can't raise your finance in a film by pre-selling territorial rights um, as easily as you could do, certainly as easy as you could do five years ago. Um, and the, the buyer's the king, the audience is king, the cons how we consume films is essential. Um, I think between the digital universe and the producers, there's going to be a, a lot fewer middlemen. Um, so if you're a content provider, I think, going forward, you're in great shape. Um, if you're one of the middlemen, which I currently am, um, you have to adapt very, very quickly. And, w for example, we're getting involved in develop developing our own material, as you suggested um, in your excellent speech, by the way, um, <laughs> um, in order to... She was brilliant, right? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> in order to, to craft um, films, and maybe in the future, hopefully, TV, that... Um, is made for the right amount of money, that is cast for the right people, that, you know, we know has a market. So, uh, based on, on all of these conversations that I've had the privilege to have with wonderful people in the industry across the last several years, I, I guess it boils down to like, the, the overall vision of what needs to happen next is, I'm just going to recap it again, strong audience focus, individual distribution strategies for each work, increased diversity, and new approaches and deeper involvement uh, by sales, distribution, and marketing. Do you agree with this vision? And do you feel that you're working in this new reality already? And I, can you hear? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know what? You know why I think one of the reasons why at least I think people are not doing that because it's quite difficult. You know, being audience focused and making for an audience and understanding an audience, it's a hell of a skill that not many people have. So that may be a problem and, and a challenge for people. Making films is really easy. Lena, what are you thinking? We are doing that. And, but we, as I said, we also spent three years in each film because all the way through from, uh, from the development and onto the distribution out in the cinemas in each territory, we are deeply involved. And we talk di directly to people. We are deeply involved in all the marketing material, the campaign, how everything works, and we are very, very much aware of who we are talking to. And we are uh, working and, and being very conscious about uh, building up fan bases, catering that, building up things that, that we know that they go for and are interested in, and, and that way slowly building up the audience to kind of a club of fans, um, which increases for every film Nicholas does. So. But are, are you, I mean, are you struggling with this as well? At least you sound frustrated that it's going so slowly. No, I don't, I, I'm not frustrated. Mm. I, I like it and I love it. And, but, but as I said, it takes us three years to do each film. Mm. So now we have just put in an extra pair of hands in the mm. company. We still want to be small and we still want to be involved in, in, in all the levels um, and be in direct contact with uh, our audience. So one important thing that, that's coming up here, of course, and you, actually you can also read a little bit about that in the report, is that the workload per film in getting it to market is, is higher for the sales companies, for distributors, and for the producers. Like somebody has to do additional work. And currently, there's no extra money in the system. So, so where should that come from? I mean, how do you... Does it, is it sustainable for you, for you as a company to invest all of this time? No, it's not sustainable business, but uh, we are still here and we hope for a better future. <laughs> okay, it's about sur surviving. Uh, I'll come to you in a moment, Martin. What about you, Mike? Do you, do you work in the, in the new production paradigm? Uh, I mean, you, you already said that you guys are making some, some content of your own. What are your main challenges? Um, well on a very pragmatic level, find, um, getting the right actors into the films is an absolute nightmare. And by right actors, I mean actors that, that bring value to a project. Um, actors are not as interested as, in, as, as they were in independent film. They are making a lot of television at the moment. They are involved in epic franchises by Marvel and Disney that take them out for nine months a year. Um, and independent film is not just not something that that is top of the top of the priority list anymore. So getting those actors, and every list is the same number of actors, by the way, it's the same people, um, is is pretty tough, you know. And distributors, the traditional independent distributors who buy all rights, they want the same actors over and over and over again. 
they're becoming more and more conservative as, they, as their own models are, are under threat. Martin, what are you thinking? So, um, just to focus on the digital aspect for a moment, uh, we will be launching a, a new scheme called uh, Promotion of European Works Online. So, I think the first word there, promotion, shows that uh, we're pretty much on the, on the same page. We, uh, we feel that uh, a lot more can be done, should be done, to make the connection between the works and the viewers, the works and, and the audience, and that uh, traditionally... Uh, a lot of the funding, a lot of the effort has gone onto the production side of the equation and not half as much onto the, the promotion side of it, the, the audience side of it. So, as we all know, there are many films produced that don't have, don't have an audience. And um, we feel that the, uh, the internet is part of the solution. It can provide uh, a new distribution channel a new way of connecting with that audience um, that possible that potential new audience there are many orphan films out there looking for audience and digital could help to find them uh, what are we to find about them an audience specifically here? I, mean, I mean maybe you don't have a specific answer but but i mean do you all agree not all films out there deserve an audience for sure but there are plenty of films that are actually quite good that don't connect to audiences I mean, digital can be a way, says so Martin. Digital is clearly the way. But how is digital going to do that? And the second thing I'm just going to say is that we, we don't is uh, one size fits all. So we heard about the, the big franchises, uh, the blockbusters. Okay, so they have a model. Uh, but for other types of films, there will be other distribution models. Um, all those films that currently are not made available, not made available in many uh, countries around Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, their VOD platforms could be part of the, of the solution. But we're not saying that everything has to be digital straight away. Mm -hmm. Films are very different. Lena, you're nodding. Why are those films not made available? It could be films like yours. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, films that are not made available are not available because nobody wants to buy the rights and because the systems for going directly out to digital platforms is not really elaborated yet and, all, and, and still it's not really the solution just to be on a digital platform, you have to market the film mm -hmm. and that's complicated to go down to each and every territory and do a specific marketing so you have to do it with somebody from the territory who knows how to do it within that territory which means you have to enter into a distribution deal with somebody and of course if if you can't find the right partner to do that, then yes, then it's really difficult. Mm. Are the are the answers out there uh, to this problem already, or do we need some new, some completely new solutions or models? Andy, I think we need new solutions. Um, I I, I feel that the digital universe has created less choice than more choice. You know, I mean, I don't know how young people nowadays discover old cinema, for example, classic cinema. Do they not at all? I think do they have to go on Amazon and buy the DVD because they or they can't. They don't have a DVD player. So, <laughs> but they can play. It, maybe they, some, they can play them in their games console. So, if they have one, yeah. But how do they find if they want to watch old Kurosawa or Truffaut or you know Renoir? Where do you find it? Hulu. Is it on Hulu? Yes, sir, yep. The Criterion Collection is that just in the US? Yeah, yeah. iTunes has some, but not everything. And I mean, it's it's also if you you can probably find Kurosawa, I, I think, everywhere. But you might not be able to find like that really great movie from 1986. And I, I guarantee you, the UK, for example, is becoming incredibly limited in its in its range of of films from around the world. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I can guarantee you that half the films playing in Cannes will never be seen in the UK. When you're saying never be seen, you're meaning in the cinema. They'll window. never be distributed. Yeah. Not even On online. On any platform. No. Yeah. Oh. Let's talk a little bit about the cinema window. Uh, how do you see? the future of, of the cinema win window in the next few years? What's going to happen, uh, Anna? Um, <clears throat> I don't know. We do documentaries, uh, theatrical documentaries, and it's a different, completely different form uh, product, really. Mm -hmm. um, you can speak about that. We don't, we don't do windows. Mm -hmm. uh, so we don't, we don't really, unless we're legally obliged to, we tend to release films and do event-based uh, releases, which cinemas are 
um, very keen on, so mm -hmm. they don't put us any kind of uh, rules in terms of windows okay, normally. Sure. But I mean, but I mean, just theatrical distribution in general. So for documentaries, there is still a big market. There is a market you feel that is yeah, strong for Yeah, event theatrical. based. Yeah, mm. yeah, we. But only event based then. Not really. Not no, only. I mean, but, yeah. you know, we're releasing Michael Moore now, and that's going to be like a longer release. Mm. But um, yeah, I mean, theatrical matters to us because it has an impact on every other window. But windows make absolutely no difference to mm. us. Yeah. What about uh, you, you, the others? Theatrical. What's going to happen now? Lena, your film was bought by Amazon in North America, no? Yeah, but Amazon is going to release it theatrically, major theatrical release with a three-month holdback. So it's not like they're going to kill a theatrical. They are actually building a theatrical distribution arm now. Uh, and I think uh, going to the cinema and seeing a film has it has to be an uh, it, it is an outstanding exp experience and it's more social than sitting in in front of uh, each in front of, of uh, their own screen at home and in uh, in many places a lot of uh, tickets are still sold to the cinemas and building pe people are building new cinemas so I think it's still going to exist there might be a discussion about which films are going to sell uh, tickets in the cinemas and the windows might be smaller for, for the smaller independent films, but I don't think that people are going to stop going to the cinema. We haven't really seen that. But a lot of people are saying that it's almost impossible to release small independents or unknown filmmakers yeah, uh, so in that's the cinema. A, that's a question of which films can actually get space in the cinema, but, but the cinemas are still there and they are still selling tickets, so it's about creating space for your film in the cinemas, and that's really tough, I know, because the smaller films have to compete with the bigger films and if they don't perform within the first couple of days then they're out again but then they go to the other platforms mm. Mike No, I, I, I agree I mean, you know, it's shortened windows it's, it's, it's which films go to the cinema I mean, most art house chains in the UK for example also play big studio movies mm. um, and most art house audiences also go and see big studio movies so, you know, I think you know the pricing is very is more and more expensive to go and see to go to the cinema. I find that very off-putting. Mm. In central London, it's eighteen, 18 pounds. pounds. It's eighteen right? pounds. Yes. <laughs> and but it's not the, it's not an eighteen pound experience. I don't feel. It's not. Sorry. It's not an eighteen pound experience. No. It's like I mean I mean it's just not, it doesn't feel like. Yeah. Um, so you might, oh sorry. No, I just think right I, ahead, you know yes, audiences yeah. need to be incentivized to go to cinema, you know. Mm. But, I mean, imagine, like, I, I just don't understand films, you know, when there was no, n no other medium, then you had to go to the cinema, but life's changed. I'm a mom, I can't go to the cinema, I don't want to go to the cinema. Mm. You know, I'm looking forward to watching stuff e every other way. C cinema is for people who can afford to go. I can't, I don't have time. Yeah. So, do I have to be you know, ghettoites because I can't go to the cinema? Well, so. uh, interestingly, it's people like you who have the answer to that question, so I'm just going to turn that straight back at you. You said yourself that the theatrical release is very, uh, is very important to, you, to your films still, and I think we also know that because of the screen squeeze, there are many films that are quite good that there will just be no space for in the cinemas. What, if it's just in a free world, if everything was, you know, if we could just dream up a good scenario, how would you release a film without theatrical? Or does it always need that one screen or the event premiere or something? I think you need, certainly you need press to, to release a film. I mean, I'm looking forward to the time when you can release a film direct to, to TV or SVOD with, and the press will support it because at the moment people are paying a lot for marketing and, and, um, the theatrical release, just in order to to get that attention that draws the audiences in, you know, and, and I mean, Netflix obviously is, is starting to make its own very expensive films that will go straight to its platform, and it will spend an enormous amount of money, as it does on its TV series now, to market those, so that's a new paradigm, and I'm kind of excited by that, to be honest, because clearly not all films are going to fit into cinemas. Mm -hmm. Martin, what are you thinking? I'm thinking that um, from our point of view, of course, uh, we love cinema, we, uh, we believe in cinema and uh, we support cinema. Uh, we, uh, we believe in the, in the social experience of it. There's a kind of community role of cinema still. 
Um, and also in the, the marketing, let's say, role of cinema is that they build uh, the reputation, the brand of, of the film. So we think cinema is here to stay, but we'll see. Nobody knows. It's one of the fascinating questions we'll, we'll see. Um, we also think that um, it's not either or, you know, it's not either cinema or m mobile devices. Interestingly, uh, people like uh, companies like Curzon in the UK and other companies elsewhere, they're doing both. They're doing both. And there's a lot of interesting complementarities. You know, you can go and see the latest uh, 19th, uh, 19th uh, Star Wars number 19, mm -hmm. and then you can catch up on the other 18 on your, on your device at home. Things like that. So um, clearly there's not enough cinemas for all the films that are produced. Clearly, in uh, Eastern Europe, there's a, there's a deficit of cinemas. Yeah? Uh, not every country has the, the network of cinemas that France has, uh, for example. And even and so countries again, that have... Different, uh, yeah. different yeah. solutions for different films, different solutions for different countries. But I think uh, it's about having the right mix, about having the right mix rather than finding the silver bullet, you know? So what do you guys say? Is there a, distinct, is there a conflict between, between television... And, and film, because I mean, I think a lot, I see a lot of film producers are moving into into TV drama. Certainly, the talent is is very attracted to it, but television, I mean, wh whatever that even means these days. But but those living room screens are are the the main funnel for films to actually reach audiences. Is there a real conflict? I think it's really exciting to be thinking, uh, you know, about series and developing new formats and. Yeah, that's what we're doing. It's, I think it's a great opportunity, a, new, a whole new opportunity. So it's, it's really exciting. And the quality is certainly great, no? Lena? I don't think there's a real conflict. But what I wanted to say about mm -hmm. the other thing is uh, if films that would get a limited theatrical release, like on the four, five, or two or three main cities of a country, that are released at the same time uh, on, on digital platforms, can actually be a lot more efficient than just releasing the film on, uh, in the theaters in, in two or three main screens in, in the main cities and then wait six months and put it out uh, digitally and, and uh, on other platforms in, um, in the other cities because you take advantage of the PR at the same time mm -hmm. and you don't lose a lot of it on, on piracy. So I actually think for a lot of films it, it works very well to be released at the same time on, on both uh, theatrical and digital platforms. Would you recommend it if, if people are sitting here, you know, financing a movie that they know will be medium-sized and might have a difficulty in theatres? Would you recommend this kind of release strategy for that kind of a film? Of course, it's, dif it's different for each film, but some of them really benefit from it. Mm. Some of the films I have done have really benefited from being released simultaneously Sim simultaneously on digital and uh, theatrical, mm. when it's done in a good way and the PR is done in a really uh, good and efficient way. Martin, I, I know that uh, you, uh, you have some positive thoughts about how content travels, specifically European television content. Uh, uh, can you talk a little bit to that? Yes, yeah, so uh, as we heard, um, unfortunately, so I'm British as well, and unfortunately in Britain, uh, I think... Uh, Britain is one of the countries in Europe with the, the least, with the smallest market for non-national European films. So the British watch the least number of films coming from other European countries. But on television, that's changing, and uh, I find that particularly encouraging. So we've seen in Britain, so which is a different market, uh, audiences have gone up on for TV uh, series produced in other European countries, whether it's Borgen or. Uh, or is it the, the Last Panthers or Versailles or things like this? And they are screened, and I find it incredible, they are screened in the original language with subtitles. So to, to imagine a, an average English family sitting down on the sofa and watching something in Danish or in German subtitled, for me that's a step forward for, for Europe. And I say that sincerely, I'm not uh, exaggerating. That's for me is a, it's is a practical... It's going to save us from the Brexit. <laughs> You said it. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a practical, tangible step forward for Europe, definitely. Because sometimes, you know, I worry that uh, the new generation of, of kids in Britain, they, they grow up with no image of Europe. Like, literally, no image. They don't know what it looks like. You know, maybe they think Berlin looks like Manhattan or Madrid looks like New Orleans. 
they never get to see them. So uh, TV is making some progress in that. Mike. I love TV. <laughs> <laughs> I really do. I love TV. And I think, you know, sometimes I, I do worry that TV is getting so compelling, <laughs> TV drama, and has movie stars and movie directors working seamlessly in it that, you know, I worry for, for, for film. Okay, but then what is it that film has that is unique? I, I mean, obviously, one thing that film has is, is the big, you know, the big explosions on the biggest screens, but, but most of us aren't very invested in that kind of film, the kind of film that we love, which is why we're here. Well, I, th I think it, what Lena was saying about what her company focuses on, ours is the same. We focus on directors, and we focus on... Um, unique voices and, and somebody's vision and I think well, that's what film does incredibly well. TV is much more a storytelling medium where you're following a story over several episodes whereas film is, is the voice and the, and the um, personality of a filmmaker. We have Andrea Arnold's film here tomorrow in competition and it's, it's just, it's, you feel Andrea when you're watching the film. It's a communication I think between the audience and the director and it's very powerful. That, that's why the medium is so brilliant to me. Mm -hmm. I agree. You agree? Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, let's, let's say this then. What do you guys see the market yearning for at this time? So what is there a demand for? And is that the same thing that you think the audience would really need to be shown? So Martin, for instance, has said that he, he feels the audience would benefit from and, and I mean, not necessarily in a pedagogical way either, you know, with the, the, the images of other countries and other experiences. And I think that those stories can be told in a way that should be appealing, right? Um, or clearly it can. What is the market yearning for and is that the right things? Yeah. Uh, I experience that the market is looking for unique uh, projects uh, and, and unique films. Um, there's a very high demand for uh, demand for for Nicholas's films, for example, uh, and at the same time, it's also incredibly difficult to build up others to get to the same level. But 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 I do think that the market really wants something which is outstanding and and being different and not just being done uh, in a in a you know fabric whatever. In a factory. What about uh, Martin? Yeah, I yeah. give Anna? room to the professionals first. But, uh, <laughs> I agree with you. Yeah, yeah. Totally. Does it original voices, strong storytelling? Yeah. In fiction, that's difficult to finance, though, if it's too original. We had, I the, have, we had the Lobster last year, the Yorgos Lanthimos film, which, which ultimately performed very well. But getting it financed was quite hard because it was so bonkers, you know. So... You know, I, I work in the independent sales business, which is an incredibly reactive business. It's all about what's succeeded in the past. It's not, about, yeah. not necessarily mm. supportive of original ideas. Mm -hmm. you know. But that's terrible. I know. I mean, that, that's absolutely... <laughs> in the context of what we've been speaking of, if the independent sales sector is reactive, we're all screwed. Yeah. I think. How do we solve this? Mm. Okay. So, uh, I was going to say, perhaps there isn't one market, you know, the market, but there are different... Uh, audiences, the different markets, and in particular, something that we, uh, we sense is that uh, there's a generational difference which is very prominent now. Mm -hmm. So uh, the market for the under 20s is very different to the market for the over 50s. And um, I think you mentioned your presentation, I've seen many presentations about this, where it's not, it's not generation X or Y or Z, but... Uh, I've forgotten the, the name, the alphabet now, but uh, the newest generation, you know, they have different values, they uh, want to be much more involved, they don't just want to sit back and be passive, uh, they want personalised content, but at the same time, um, they love stories, you know, and they appreciate a good story, they want a good story, they don't want some kind of fake gimmick, but um, one of the things I am con we are concerned about is whether the European film industry, feature film industry, you know, is losing the, the under 20s, the, uh, the young audiences, the young audiences, because as we know, the young are the future. So if, if the European uh, film industry is not getting the young audiences, 
what does that mean for the future of the, of the film industry? I think that's a concern. I think we can say, safely say that the European film industry is not getting the young audiences right now. I mean, it's not a hypothetical. That's, that's just a fact. So, but surely, I mean, surely, uh, says she in a voice of desperation, surely that doesn't mean that everything, you know, will die 20 years from now. Where does, how do we get that? I mean, we, we keep circling around this topic. We can't get the new talent if we can find it, then we can't get it funded. And the, the, these original voices that would be needed to create a, a generation of filmmakers like, like that that came in the 90s with Lars von Trier and, and everybody else, how do we make that happen? I mean, you're, you're I think there, there, will, there will be a generation of, of filmmakers. It's just that, as you well said, there's you know, other, you know, other types of entertainment and there's too many films for you know, too little time and something's got to give and there's just not enough space and they have to accept. So only the few good ones will make it and the rest won't, I who, think. Who has to accept? You mean the filmmakers, the, the, yes. the potential, people who want yeah. to make film? Yeah, it's yeah. like, you know, like having a lot of food and then one person trying to shove food down. I mean, there's just enough food you can eat. That's a fact. But, I mean, filmmakers aren't born ready. Quite often, I mean, there are people who will, who will, you know, do things on their computer and then come out with one pearl that will be like a finished, mature film, and then that'll be the launch of their career. But is, is, the, is it realistic to think that all of the new voices from now on will, will do that? They'll work outside the system until they can prove themselves? But it has kind of always been like that, that people start doing films on their own, and then those who are good succeed in doing something that somebody likes to see and then they do something a little bigger and a, a little more complicated, it, that, that's not new. But now uh, the new thing is they just do it on their iPhone on some, uh, or something and, and maybe there's a gap between those who can get financed now and those who are starting doing it uh, on their iPhone. But I think that there will be a new wave of other filmmakers coming up doing it their way. If, if you guys have children, hypothetically, your hypothetical children would come up to you and say, I, would, I want to go to film school. Would you tell them, don't do it? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, would say, I would say, you know, um, do this other thing, and I'll be your manager on the side. Like, so if you still want to become a filmmaker, let's do it together. I'll support you, but do that first, just in case it doesn't work out. <laughs> okay. But, but would, you still, would you still trust them to learn filmmaking in film school? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. okay, no, yeah. it's good. I mean, it's, I mean, it's, they're, maybe they're teaching the old paradigm, I'm not sure. What about Martin? Would you advise young people to go to film school, your kids? Uh, well, young people and my kids are two different things. Ah, okay, uh, would, you, <laughs> <laughs> would you advise your kids to go to film school? So, uh, as a parent, I'd say go for it, of course. If, you have, if, you want, if you're into it, if you're passionate, go for it, but have a plan B, because uh, uh, an actor's life is a hard life, mm -hmm. and a, a director's life perhaps is even harder. But and a documentarist is the hardest of them all, I think, yeah. Uh, Mike, what do, you, what do you say? Well, film school's quite expensive, isn't it, to go yeah. to? So I don't know if I'd pay for that. <laughs> <laughs> it's an unsafe investment, you wouldn't. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I'd like uh, to, to let the audience come in. I should have warned you first that you, that you might be able to ask questions. Does any of you have questions? There's one right there. Hi, uh, I'm from India. Uh, actually, I have a couple of questions, if, if that's okay. Let's uh, do one first. Sorry? Let's do one first. Okay. Uh, so my first question is, uh, we were talking about uh, releasing a movie at two pl platforms simultaneously. That is a theater and uh, the... A digital platform for mm -hmm. that, say. But uh, I mean, we've uh, from our productions uh, end, we've tried doing it. But uh, the thing is that the theaters are not accepting it. It's good for the digital platforms because they're getting an exclusive release and an early mm -hmm. release. But for the theaters, they're like, why should we do it when someone can s watch it at home at the same time? So why would someone come to our theater? And especially for mid-budgeted mid films, which are not too, obviously, which are not. Uh, uh, bound to run too well so like what 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 is the way out for that that's very good so if if you're uh, if you're if the theaters are resisting your theatrical release what how should you approach it does anyone have a practical i do think theaters have got to have got to adapt their own model i mean it is a different business the exhibition business to to film distribution but um there are certain realities about how consumers want films and they want them now and you're going to have to be agnostic about where they see them. And I think theatres have to adapt. You know, 
it's the same in Western Europe as well. You know, the, the theatres penalise you if you go out day and day on VOD. In the UK, Curzon has its own VOD platform so it, and its own cinemas, so it kind of owns both, both worlds. But, um, you know, it's, it's going to be essential. Do we have any more advice on this? No? I think there is something called walling. Uh, that is used in America where the theaters are very resistant, where you just actually buy, you just rent the cinema. It looks to the, to the visitors like, like this film is, scro- is, uh, is screening in a normal way, but you take all the risk. Um, but then you have to really believe in your product, I think. But that's, that's one way to get around it. I guess course. you also need to ask yourself, do you need the cinema? Yeah, do you need the cinema? Yeah, that's a really important question, I think. Any other questions? Yes. Is there a microphone coming? Hello. I'm not. A, hello. Jane Liscombe. Um, we had a film called The Mule in Australia, which um, was funded with, you know, in, in Australia, it's a bit like um, Britain, and uh, you have your funding bodies. And as part of that, you have um, a, a system where you have to basically put it in cinemas to get your rebate of 40%. But there was a loophole. And in that loophole of the tiny wording, it was you just needed to screen in cinemas. So what we did is we four walled and we marketed it in the cinemas to people with Q&As so that the talent could come along and people could... We had packed out cinemas and I actually made money on my cast and crew screening. Crazy. And it paid for the drinks afterwards. It was brilliant. But then it went on to iTunes and we did a Twitter event where we had um, a worldwide Twitter party and people could tweet. If you pushed play on iTunes at the same time around the world, you could basically watch the film together with the talent from the film because we'd learned fantastic. from another festival I went to that twittering, tweeting with your talent is actually one of the ways to engage your audience because they want to have direct dialogue. Like It's mm. like walking on the red carpet. I mean, you see how many people have turned out to see people just walk 20 metres away from them. You, you know, They want to have an interaction with those people. So give them the interaction. Suddenly they buy your film. And our film went from the bottom of the pile... And it went above 21 Jump Street. Like, it moved. As I was, and I'm not a tweeter. I, I never tweeted before. I was like, what the hell do I do? You know? And so I guess my question to you guys who are of, of a world where you've known the old, you know, you're very much entrenched in the old paradigm and you're having to make the new rules, or we're all making the new rules of the new paradigm. How do we make the exhibitors? I mean, ha- we have to change the exhibitors' way of looking at it and the rules of funding. Because if the funding says you have to go to the cinema... Yeah. Ultimately, your, your, your question before the lady stated, why do you need the cinema? Well, you need it to get your rebate back. Yeah, that's great. So the, the old power structures, like funders, like cinema, old gatekeepers are, you know, are, are thinking in old ways. And of course they would. Their power is entirely based on this. What can we do? Martin, you look like you have an idea. No, no <laughs> I, uh, I have to double check when I get back to the office. But uh, as far as I know, um, we do not um, make that a condition uh, for support. Uh, Many national funding bodies still do. Yeah, it. so yeah. I'm talking for the, the media yeah. program at European level. We support distribution, including online distribution, online release costs, and um, yeah, the two things are complementary: online, offline. It's not a it's not a preliminary condition. No, mm-hmm. for us, no. Anybody else? I thought there was a brilliant case also. You know, Twitter didn't know what their business model was. Then they figured out that 46% of primetime tweets are about television. So that, then they're like, oh, so we are a platform for talking about television and stuff. That's pretty much literally what it says when they did their, their, their IPO. Um, okay, do we have one more question from the yeah. audience? Yes. Uh, okay, um, Mark Ashmore from Future Artists. Um, my company has been doing this for like seven years, so it's awesome that... It's all shifting. So we've worked hard to build up our brand and everything. I know we spoke last year and stuff. So my question to the, to the panel there is, um, obviously, uh, with the tech industry, it's a billion, billion dollar industry. Um, how many of your companies has, or half of your company, in my opinion, should be a tech company or startup? How many of you are heavily investing in your tech, your big data, your social? Because that's where the content is being created and moved to. Uh, uh, how are you handling that in your company, especially with, with two people? We're only uh, eight people, so I know how hard that is. So th- that's my question. How much tech are you investing in? Yeah. We, we don't invest uh, an awful lot of, of uh, money in it, but we have uh, two young guys 
uh, who are in the early 20s, who are doing a Facebook page for the film, for example, and they have done that since the early development, just f uh, also finding out what everybody else is saying on the internet because uh, our director has a very huge fan base which is very much on the internet. So there's a lot of dialogue going on and a lot of fan-created uh, posters and things uh, that, that they are collecting, and um, then they are basically not saying very much of the film because our strategy is don't say anything because the fantasy is better than, than actual facts because the, the actual film is, is really finished. But they managed to build up um, uh, the Facebook page with enough fans so that when Amazon bought the film, they said, well, we want to take over the Facebook page. And we said, no, 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 this is our strategy, our long-term strategy, so you can have an English language uh, feed on our website, uh, on, on our Facebook. So now every country uh, that are distributing the film and it's sold worldwide, they all have their own language uh, national feed on our Facebook site which means that, that it's growing very rapidly. And, and it also tells me, okay, my young guys has done something which is good enough. <laughs> and then some cast, some of the cast is tweeting uh, mm -hmm. and, and everybody else is, is like doing a lot of things that these two young guys are sitting. And, and they are perfect because they are the generation that grew up with Facebook. I, I don't check it very often, but I see that it's growing and, and it's working. But they are exactly like, they're doing it like they, every day they go on yeah. Facebook anyway. So it's uh, kind I'm of realizing <laughs> we're running out of time. Do any, either yeah. of you, any of you have anything more to um, say on tech? Yeah, Anna. I mean, similarly, 80% uh, of our spend mm -hmm. um, selling and releasing films online. Um, we hardly do any traditional. We have a social media department and we are heavily investing in VR, developing uh, partnerships and extra content for our documentaries. So investment te in technology in general, uh, we think is very important for the audiovisual sector. It's a weakness in Europe, uh, not enough investment in technology. I would not agree when you said the, the earthquake has already happened, we can relax. I think technology is a, is a continuum, it never stops, so we're just moving along this continuum. There will always be something new. The question is, what will it be and who will invent it? And if you don't invest, then you, it's not going to be you. But it's going so to come out of California if, if it, we don't work aggressively. And it, it has until recently. And mm -hmm. The history of cinema is a, is a succession of technological disruptions, and it will probably continue. And we just need to invest more to make sure we're shaping the future, not just catching up with it. Mm -hmm. I've answered your own question yeah. about the European noise. Sorry, I... Uh, yeah. No, sorry, we have to, to, to run uh, up. What about you, Mike? Did you have anything on tech? Well, not really, because we, we sell our films to distributors who, who are more um, in touch with the audiences through technology. So, so they get to do that yeah, part. They, they can do that. Very well. I, I'm going to ask to end uh, this by asking each of you to give a piece of solid advice. So based on your experience, can you give, tell the audience something, like maybe something that's blindingly obvious to you, that it always annoys you, that other people in the industry aren't doing, or maybe like a tiny thing that you think that you've done that's pretty nifty that you suggest that our, other people would copy? Who would like to start? Lena. My only mantra is never give up. <laughs> <laughs> never give up, never <laughs> surrender. Yeah. yeah. What about um, you, Anna? Mine is, um, as a marketeer, think from the outside in, never from the inside out. Okay. As a funder, uh, I would say uh, mix it up. You know, don't choose between uh, offline, old line, new and old. Find a new mix, find a new blend. And Mike? Um... I don't know, really. Like, you know, I think we, we, we have to respect the consumer. I mean, that's ultimately what this business has to be about. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you again to the Marche. Please give a big hand to Lena, Mike, Anna and Martin.